Stick around to the end of this video because I have a huge announcement about the future of this show. Yes, we did an up to speed on the RX-7 a little over two years ago. No, you are not going crazy. It was our seventh episode of this series. This is everything you need to know to get up to speed on the Mazda RX-7. Man, I sounded like I don't even care about this freaking car, but guys, I want you to know that I do. I love this car. I care and love about this car so much that I wanted to do it again. Today, we're gonna talk about this automotive icon's game-changing tech, how it developed over its lifetime, and dive deep into the awesome community centered around this car that's seeing a huge resurgence right now. <laughs> Buckle up for the best reboot since Andrew Garfield's Spider-Man because this is everything you need to know to get up to speed on the Mazda RX-7 2020 edition! A big old thank you, Gavnad keeps for once again sponsoring today's episode of Up to Speed. You've heard about all the signs. One day you've got a full flowing follicles of fun. The next day you're in the shower scrub-a-dub dubbing that head of yours. You look down, what's that? Why do my hands look like a Yeti's hands? Oh wait, that's my hair falling out. That's even worse than Yeti's hands. Well fight back against your failing follicles with keeps. Don't be the two out of three guys that'll experience hair loss like this before they're even 35. Keeps offers online doctor visits and will even deliver your hair loss medication directly to your door every three months. No more hiding that pale peach fuzz head while waiting in line at the pharmacy. So hurry up, don't lose any more precious hair, start your Keeps treatment ASAP as treatments typically take four to six months to see results. So what are you waiting for? When you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, go to keeps.com slash up to speed 50 or click the link in the description to receive 50% off your first order. That's K E E P S dot com slash up to speed 50. And now back to the show. Up to speed. Chapter one Willy Wankel's Dorito Factory. Augustus Gloop is stuck in the apex seals. Old me was right about one thing. It would be impossible to discuss the RX-7 without talking about its engine. We really do need to start with the motor because it's why this car is so unique. The RX-7 used what's called a Wankel rotary engine. And if you've been watching Donut, you know that we've talked about this engine a bunch. It's time to do a deep dive on the rotary. The Wankel rotary, the magic Dorito box. I love rotaries, I need to get an RX-7. A rotary engine. No, 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 it's rotary time. And if that's not enough, you can listen to the literal two hours of us talking about it in a two-part series of our podcast, Past Gas. I'll put a link to that in the description below. The Vanco Rotary Engine was invented in 1951 by a dude named Dr. Felix Venkel, which is objectively top 10 funniest names in automotive history. And there are a ton of funny names in the history of cars. And it was designed to be an alternative to the piston engine. The quick and dirty version of how this thing works is gonna be covered in a Tech Talk. An engine creates force by trapping fuel air mixture inside a chamber, pressurizing it and exploding it. The force from those explosions moves the parts of the engine, which in turn move the rest of the drivetrain. In a standard four-stroke engine, pistons create those pressure chambers. In a rotary engine, a triangular rotor creates them, hence the name. It does that by rotating around the inside of an oblong oval. As it moves, it creates space to intake more fuel mixture while simultaneously pressurizing fuel in another part of the oval. There are pros and cons to both, which again, uh, <laughs> if you want to know more detail about that, check out those other videos. But the top line benefits of a rotary engine are weight, power, and price. Surprisingly, no matter what you've heard. <laughs> The Venkel has a power to weight ratio of three to one over a standard engine. It also revs at significantly higher RPMs and since it doesn't have nearly as many parts, it's much cheaper to produce than a piston engine. In the 60s, Mazda's president, Tsuneji Matsuda, saw potential in the rotary engine and licensed it from NSU. NSU used to be Audi. 
pretty cool. And NSU Audi were the first ones to pick it up from Dr. Avankel. Once they had the tech, an engineer at Mazda named Kenichi Yamamoto solved the last big problem with the engine apex seals. There's a big problem with rotaries, and that problem, much like my middle school football team, is scoring. As the triangle in a rotary rotates, the tips or apexes score the inside of the oval, and over time this means incomplete seals in the combustion chamber, leading to engine failure. So what do you do? You put a strip of graphite over those apexes that would wear more evenly and preserve the integrity of the chambers, an invention called an apex seal. Now, NSU and Audi had a version of the apex seal, but it was Yamamoto who really improved the design, making this engine a viable option. So with that problem solved, and like a bunch of boring legal stuff that includes the gas crisis that you guys don't wanna hear about, after that stuff was solved, it was finally time for this bad boy to be dropped into one of the most badass cars of all time. This is not an up to speed on the rotary. This is an up to speed on the RX-7. I'm talking about the myth, the prettiest boy at the ball, the RX-7. Chapter two, the FB RX-7. Mazda's first car with a Wankel was the 1967 Mazda Cosmo. It was a halo car and was gonna serve as their proof of concept for the rotary engine. On their next rotary model, Mazda went all in. The RX-3 Savannah was after the Cosmo in the rotary lineup, and it developed a rep as being sporty, despite being a five-seat passenger car with no particular performance features. That's how much fun everyone was having with the Vankel. Mazda saw this and said, oh, you like fun? Well, why didn't you say something? We can give you fun. And they got to work on the RX-7, which would be a true sports car. For this car, Mazda took their inspiration from the Lotus Elan. And you can see it in the long sloping hood with the pop-up up, up and down friggin' headlights. I mean, these things just look really fast. Oh yeah, immediately. I can tell that that is a very fast car, but I am a very intuitive person. You stink. Now Mazda knew that customers might be wary of buying a performance car with a rotor since it was so unfamiliar. So they idiot proofed the rest of the car to keep from intimidating customers. It's like when you're trying to get your kid to eat broccoli, so you put a bunch of cheese on top. In this case, the cheese was the super simple McPherson struts up front and an unfussy live axle in the back. Disc brakes for the front and drum brakes in the back which any mechanic would be familiar with. The steering was a very simple worm and roller system rather than the more complex rack and pinion. Oh, we'll come back to that in a minute. And if all that is googly gook to you, just know that it's a very, very simple standard setup and it was all done intentionally to make this car totally approachable in spite of this wild new powertrain. The simplicity did have a drawback though. None of this stuff that I just said is particularly sporty. And this was a gosh darn sports car. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Come on. Mazda wasn't worried though, because what it lacked in performance technology, it made up for in weight distribution. She's a good looking girl, she's got good weight distribution. Now because Wankels are so small, Mazda could put it low in the car and behind the front axle. They called it a front midship design. And it meant that the RX-7 had a near perfect 50-50 balance and a very low center of gravity. The car debuted in 1978. This first model was called the FB and made a blistering 101 horsepower. People were still psyched for it though because the curb weight was just 2,300 pounds, so it could zip. Rotary engines by design need to be driven hard or they'll build up carbon deposits. So Mazda actually advised people to drive this at Redline a lot. And enthusiasts were like, okay, twist my arm, why don't you? Performed so well at high rev that Mazda actually had to install a warning buzzer to let you know that you needed to pull back because the car felt so right being pushed. And before the end of the first gen, Mazda introduced a turbo version, which upped the power to 160. So considering the weight, <laughs> this thing absolutely freaking flew. Chapter three, A, B, F, C. 
The second generation of the RX-7 would be completely restyled. And instead of a Lotus inspiration, designers looked at Porsche 924s and 944s. Just as it did during the end of the FB generation, these new FCs would have two engine options, baby. The naturally aspirated 12A and the turbo 13B. This time the 12A would make 146 hertz per and the 13B would put out 189, almost double the original base model, which means, say it with me, more power, baby. I didn't even exist the last time you did this one. I made you and you all made me. I'm not even real. I'm a figment of your collective consciousness. New RX-7. Mazda took the opportunity to make the whole thing more refined. The FC was launched in 1986, so the RX-7 had been around long enough so they didn't need to baby mechanics anymore. The most noticeable change was the upgrade to rack and pinion steering. The first RX-7's oversteer was so bad on account of the worm and roller, but the rack and pinion helped clear that up a little. Handling was also improved by the addition of fully independent suspension and a dynamic traction suspension system, which offered limited rear steering to fully correct oversteer. And disc brakes all around, because it ain't fun to go fast if you can't stop. Overall, this generation had a much softer feel in line with a GT car. Some enthusiasts were a little disappointed by the more disconnected feel, but it sold great. It blows my mind that people were saying this that long ago. <laughs> Oh, it basically drives itself. It's like, it's such a primitive car. Now it feels like you're driving a skateboard. This gen would see a few special models. There was a convertible, which was way cooler than James Gardner made it look in the commercial. Spend some time getting to know Mazda's new RX-7, but I'll warn you, it'll flat spoil you for anything else. There is also the 10th anniversary edition with 16 inch wheels, crystal white paint, freaking bronze tinted windows. I didn't even know that was a thing. And a rotor emblem on the front fender. The tag for it was very special, very scarce, which is actually the same way I described on its new gas crisis shirt. Remember when I made a joke about making an oil crisis shirt and you guys were like, yeah, you should do that. Well, we did it. Go to DonutMedia.com and get yourself a sweet oil crisis shirt. It's got a car coming out of a thing and oil squirt all over the place. And then it's got all the malaise air cars down on the bottom. It's one of my favorite designs that we've ever done. I love the gas can on the front. Go to DonutMedia.com and get you one. Up to speed. There was also a limited run of an RX-7 GTU model designed to be even more lightweight for racing. That made sense because by this point, the RX-7 had a super impressive motorsports resume. Going back a little bit, early in its history, in 1979, RX-7s placed first and second at the 24 Hours of Daytona. Then, in 1981, it edged out a BMW 530i for a win and the Spa 24, which made a huge statement, not only for Japanese sports cars in general, but also for this new fangled triangle engine. Professional racers and cool but dangerous street racers started picking up RX-7, so Mazda made a model for him. Chapter four. The yellow one from the cartoon. The next big redesign came in 1992 with the FD RX-7. And for a lot of you, this is why you're watching this video. The FD is not only arguably the best RX-7, it's one of the best Japanese sports cars of all time. For starters, it's absolutely beautiful. I mean, look at this thing. It's one of the prettiest cars ever made. I, I love them. Mazda did away with the molding around the exterior of the previous generation for an incredibly clean, unbroken line. They even hid the door handle up near the window so that nothing interrupts the visual flow. Very, very Mazda. While the first model was inspired by a Lotus and the second model was inspired by a Porsche, on the FD, Mazda designers went completely their own way. It's just timeless. And it's not just the look that makes the FD a legend. It has to be said again, because it's so important to the car. The RX-7's weight distribution was incredible. It was so well balanced and the handling was so precise that you could just toss this car around. And this generation was a return to its more performance oriented roots. There was a touring model, yeah, but enthusiasts loved the R models. The R stands for 
They had stiffer suspension because of Bilstein shocks. They had an oil cooler so you don't overheat at the track. They had a front air dam and a big old spoiler. And finally, any video about the RX-7 is gonna include a section on the FD's ultra smooth sequential twin turbo. All the videos make such a big deal out of this because that power delivery meant a boost for almost the entire rev range. And because rotary engines don't really make a lot of torque or until they get into high RPMs, this was a game changer for performance. It was amazing. So if everyone loved the FD so much, why did Mazda cancel it in 2002? What the hell happened to it? Well, a few things. First of all, we've been talking for most of the video about how amazing rotary engines are, but if they're so amazing, why doesn't every car have one or literally any other car? Because it turns out they're kind of a pain in the ass. Remember those graphite apex seals I was talking about? They break and wear out kind of a lot. And when they do, you can have total engine failure. <laughs> protect the seals, oil is injected into the engine, but that leads to its own problems, which also has a little bit to do with another problem, bad emissions. Wankels get really crappy fuel economy, and the 13V turbo in particular gets very hot. So hot, in fact, that Mazda had to put a huge warning light right on the center stack. And in addition to all of that, Ford showed up at the party and did what Ford does, ruin the party. Ford bought a controlling share of Mazda in the 90s and went to work on a new car, the RX-8. Nobody will directly say that the RX-8 was meant to replace the RX-7, but the timing and name are very suspicious. The RX-8 tried to solve a lot of the RX-7's problems, but in doing so, created some real messes. Rather than being a compact two-seater, it was now a weird four-door thing, four-seater which meant that it was longer and it was heavier. So that perfect weight balance was off now, ruined. They also tried to overcome the heat and emissions problems by getting rid of the freaking turbo. Without the turbo, the RX-8 got very little torque, maxing out at 160 pound feet. That's like a freaking 90s Honda. It does have its fans. I don't want to poo poo on it, but the general consensus is that this car was a mere shadow of the thrill that was the RX-7. Chapter five, the RX-7 legacy. Now, one of the things that I mentioned in the intro to this video is the community and how the community around this car is having a really big resurgence right now. Something that I didn't get into at all last time was just how much this car means to car people. For a car nerd, this is like up there. This is like one of those, you know? It's like pretty much on everyone's bucket list. First of all, a whole generation of enthusiasts was basically created by stuff like the Fast and the Furious and Dominic Toretto himself drove a 93 FD. This 93 FD. If you pay close attention, you'll even see an animation of the inside of the motor, even though I'm pretty sure they used V8 noises for it. <laughs> And if Fast and Furious didn't turn you into a car person, a video game might have. And the RX-7 grew up right alongside driving games. So it's all over the place. Here it is in Gran Turismo. Here it is in Forza. Here it is in Initial D. Here it is in Sega GT. You could literally grow up with the car by playing it in your bedroom. <laughs> if you were lucky enough to have a TV in your bedroom. And if pretending to be a pretend race car driver isn't your thing and you just want to watch pretend race car drivers do their thing, there's a little thing called Initial D, where not one, but two of the main characters drive RX-7s. And if you don't like pretend races at all, the RX-7 kept ripping in real life races. Like I said, once it established itself on the scene, it stayed there. In 1991, Mazda took everything they learned from the RX-7 and applied it to the 787B, which would go on to win the 24 hours of Le Mans. That would be the first time a Japanese car would win and it wouldn't happen again until Toyota and Gazoo took it in 2018. There's a very, very interesting story to this race. And if you want to learn more about that, I, I can't encourage you enough to check out our two-part podcast on the rotary. Listen to this thing. Sounds like a pissed off pig. 
The RX-7 was also the winningest car in the IMSA circuit in the 80s. The RX-7 dominated the IMSA GTU series for 10 solid years from 1982 through 92 and won more IMSA races than any other model. All this stuff means that there are some really special examples that car folks have gotten into. We did a whole bumper to bumper on high low co-host Aaron Parker's FD, but I'm mentioning it again here so that we can put it on screen because it is so sick. Definitely one of the coolest cars that my friends have. And Aaron's one of my coolest friends. Abel Ibarra has a virtual RX-7 empire and is the most famous person ever to drag race a rotary engine. If you're at all into rotaries, you gotta check out what that dude's doing. You've also gotta check out Rob Dom's RX-7. It's a four rotor beast with all wheel drive that he's been working on for years. This thing is a engineering marvel. That thing is awesome. He has a million videos on it. You should check him out. And everybody's favorite Crocs god, Hurt from Hoonigan, has a 450 horsepower RX-7 that he's lovingly nicknamed the Twerk Stallion. It's a very, very cool car. It's... Good job, Hurt. <laughs> now, all these guys make awesome videos with rad cars, so technically, they're my competition, but, but I gotta shout them out because car culture is most fun when it's about community, and that community is at its raddest when you're talking about something as unique, as rare, as fully freaking legendary as the Mazda RX-7. Hey guys, for the first time in 167 weeks, we're gonna take a little tiny break on up to speed. Nothing's changing, we just got some really big apps coming up and we wanna focus on those. Plus, I promised Nolan that I would teach him how to ride a bike by the end of the summer, and the summer's almost over. So I wanna be a good friend and teach my friend how to ride a two-wheeler. Um, we'll be back in about a month uh, with bigger, badder, cooler, sweeter shows. Until then, you can watch me on the D-list, uh, you can listen to me on the podcast, and uh, I love you. So post your RX-7 up on Instagram, tag me at James Pumphrey, tag Donut at Donut Media. I'll throw you guys on my story, give you a little shout. Thank you guys for watching this video and all the other videos on Donut. If you liked it, make sure you hit that subscribe button and the notification bell so you don't miss anything. Well, let me 